الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وامته اجمعين you know, alhamdulillah it's the f- depending where one is the 15th 16th of ramadan we've passed half of ramadan with the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his rahma his mercy his grace his fazl and karam on the people of Gaza and Palestine in the sense that no war has yet started in Rafah. Allah Alam, do not put it beyond the imagination that the ultimate evil of these people would be that they want to launch their offensive in the last 10 days itself. So continue to make, we should all continue to remember, make dua from the people of Gaza. And more importantly, remember that there's a much more deeper offensive already underway, which is the offensive of famine and starvation, which has been a war crime used by the most evil of dictators and the most evil of despots and the most evil of people throughout human history. And while people may have thought that we had moved past barbarianism and evil, this country has reminded us Uh, that evil and barbarianism are very much alive and oppression and injustice is alive and we should all make a lot of shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescue all of our brethren in Gaza and wider Philistine the Uyghurs, the Rohingya, the Ahl Sudan and so many others in so many places And really, especially those of you who are medical professionals, every one of you in heart and spirit, if not maybe yet, because you're a student, if not maybe yet, in body, but all of you should be in that spirit of the doctors without borders, medicine sans frontières, that you are, you know, inshallah, have niyyah and intention that you will serve in your medical capacity. Uh, those unfortunate, distressed and war-ravaged and war-stricken members of this ummah. And, you know, really, I think this year Ramadan is different. You know what I'd wanted to do, but I didn't have the strength and the time to do it myself this year. I wanted to actually do every night the juz of the Quran, specifically tafsir of one juz, specifically looking uh, at the lessons one could learn for the people of Gaza, from the people of Gaza, based on Quran. I did some of that for myself. In my own recitation and reflection, but I was not able to unfortunately prepare that. But inshallah, it's something, even if I couldn't do in Ramadan, something I want to do after Ramadan, inshallah. And by that I mean that inshallah, whatever remaining recitation, reflection of Quran al-Karim you have, think about the moment you live in, the time you live in. Think about the people who are suffering from tragedy and try to find that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your recitation and reflection. But also reflect on the many, many places in Qur'an al where Allah ta'ala makes it clear that if we don't rise up and if we don't stand up and if we don't adopt taqwa and if we don't become strong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not guide us uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy may not envelop us. And that's why it's very important that generally the theme that is given And that is gen- it's still the case this year. And that is that these last upcoming last and final 10 days of Ramadan are a time where a person goes all out in ultimate istighfar and tawbah, making, seeking the forgiveness and begging and making repentance and begging for Allah's mercy. But this year it's different 
Whereas in previous years we did it for ourselves, this year all of us we have to do it for the Ummah. Because as an Ummah we have failed. As an Ummah we have allowed ourselves to become so weak. It's easy to just blame it on the rulers and governments and no doubt the Muslim rulers and Muslim governments of today, except for a few, illa mashallah, will I, Allah alam how they will stand in front of Allah SWT on the Day of Judgment. But really you and me also should think. And some of you, you know, many of you who are listening who are younger, uh, take it from one who is older, who is cross 50, uh, that my generation uh, has certainly failed this ummah, and you are now the next generation. And at the very least, you can make dua and you can beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that don't let your generation fail the way my generation failed in allowing the ummah to be in such a vulnerable, such a weak, such a utterly incapacitated state that they can be innocent mu'mineen and mu'minat can be picked off and murdered from the sky by some evil individual with a joystick in his hand controlling a drone right and the children of this ummah and the women of this ummah and the men also of this ummah can be starved to death slowly through slow crippling famine and starvation while no one in the ummah has the strength and power to defend them and rescue them from this atrocity. And you, mashallah, alhamdulillah, many of you would know and aware and some of you might be working with and networking with many human, non-Muslims. It's just human. It's not just the dehumanization of the Palestinians. It's the inhumanity of the world that has allowed this to happen. But mashallah, alhamdulillah, you have seen that there are many non-Muslims also who have escaped the fitna of inhumanity and that is a fitna now i'm going to i'm giving it a name live with you the fitna of inhumanity this is the fitna we live in and it makes sense because that's the precursor to the fitna of the jal right because the way that the jal is described in the hadith is basically inhuman it's an inhuman unimaginable level of evil and violence uh, and this is what we're seeing and we're living through that moment and it's happened recently, as I mentioned, the Uyghurs and the Rohingyas, but we weren't so aware of it, we weren't so exposed to it, we weren't so sensitized to it. So that's the second thing we should make a stick far to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, individually, but also on behalf of the Ummah, that Ya Allah, how many atrocities have happened in my watch, in my lifetime? You know, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Ayun kasuddin wa ana hay? That is it possible that in the deen, even the slightest imperfection, the slightest flaw, the slightest defect, the slightest nooks can happen in deen. Wa'ana means, and I, Abu Bakr, am alive, means that my ghayra, my, 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 how to put ghayra in English, my, my self-respecting faith, my dignity, my honor, my self-respect, my identity of myself and of the ummah, could never tolerate this. I would immediately go. What he means is, I will immediately go into complete action. Never could something like this happen in my watch, right? And I know practically you and me don't have the ability to stop the evil, right? Stop it, as they say, as the Kareem sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam said, that stop it with action. By hand means with action. But whatever actions in our ability, be that raising the voice, be that organizing, be that protesting, or be it the action of du'a, and what I'm saying now is the action of istighfar and the action of toba, right? And maybe, who knows, you know, of all of us shed more tears in, in the coming last, starting now, but especially in the coming last 10 days and nights, who knows whose tear Allah SWT will accept, right? Surely Allah SWT has already accepted millions of tears, millions, literally, millions, because there's over 2 million people who are in this war-ravaged zone. Millions of tears of these millions of Ahl Gaza. And if nothing else, if we should only have shame, that if nothing else I could do, I could join my tears with their tears. So now you have to think that, okay, I spent the first 15 days of Ramadan for myself. I fasted for myself. I fasted for the sake of Allah Spanta, for His pleasure. And now I need to step up my game and I need to become better. I need to be stronger for the sake of this ummah, for the sake of this deen, for the sake of the weak and the oppressed people of deen. And that's how you motivate yourself. That's how you pick yourself up out of this mid-Ramadan slump. We can't afford a slump. 
There's no space for slump. There's no scope for slump. There's no toleration left. We should be, we have to have, we have to go tough on ourselves. And to push ourselves and motivate ourselves. And so this, in a sense, is a final stretch. It's the, it's, you know, you can call it the sprint before the marathon, really. Because actually, in some sense, the whole 11 months after Ramadan is like a marathon. <laughs> And so we're going to sprint to this finish line of Eid, inshallah. But remember that actually really what we're doing, in a sense, is not so much sprinting, but getting strength for the marathon that lies ahead. And we have a long drought in front of us. There's no immediate sense that things are going to become better. Right? And so make dua to Allah subhanahu for this also, especially in the last last moments and days of Ramadan they also want to give me strength so the Arabic words for this give me hilm give me tahammul give me zarf give me capacity give me forbearance give me load bearing capacity because Ya Rabbi Kareem I see on this ummah a huge load and I see that load only increasing and I think maybe from now all the way to Dajjal whenever that may be it's just going to be an increasing load and then I look at myself and I see how weak I am how frail I am how fragile my yakin is so that Ya Allah make me strong in this month. For my own sake, for my family's sake, for my community's sake, for my society's sake, and for the sake of the Ummah. So we have to really, this is an incredible, we're not going to get a chance, just think, Allah, al Amana, al Fees, may Allah protect us, but who knows what type of horrors and atrocities and evils the following 11 months, yani from Shawal onward, are going to have. Me and you have a golden opportunity now in these remaining 14, 15 days of Ramadan, night, days and nights of Ramadan to fill up our hearts with that spiritual strength that will hopefully help us navigate those next 11 months of the year. So think like that. You know, that's how people think in their worldly life, right? They plan, I'm going to do this intensive thing and it's going to pay off. I'm going to do this extra. I'm going to do, so let me start teasing some of you. I'm going to go do this fellowship and that one year fellowship, oh, it's going to last me 20 years. Hmm? So now you think that this is what this last 10-15 days of Ramadan is. That, and that's how much I need. I don't think we've ever, I can say about certainly myself in my lifetime, I've never seen such a state of desperation or felt such a state of desperation. And as I tell you, I don't mean to be bleak, but I don't see things getting better and I see things getting worse over the next, you know, in the immediate future. All right, so I think this topic is well understood. Second major thing, uh, I mean, there's an, I, I, I could not emphasize what I just said enough for myself and for all of you, but I do want to share some other pointers today. A second major thing that happens to us in Ramadan, which I touched a bit on last time when this notion of maximizing, today I'm just going to use a simple word, which in Arabic would be called talab. It used to be one of my very favorite words, and a couple of times in my life I've given a whole bayan just on this concept of talab. Talab means desire, a wish. And it's a desire and wish that creates in you, gives rise to a willpower and determination and action so that you fulfill that desire and wish. It's that desire and wish that is so overpowering, so overwhelming, it cannot arise in you except that it motivates you and drives you. It's like a passion. All right. And again, a lot of us have used that. For so many, to study so many things in this world, to achieve so many types of success in this world. So, part of Ramadan is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a chance to reignite our talab, to renew that talab in our heart, right? And by now, you know, we should have that flaming, burning, passionate desire to become a good mu'min and to earn the pleasure of Allah, to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is one thing I would say that if it hasn't happened yet, work on it. And, you know, sometimes I would give a story. It's a little bit long, but I'll try to do it quickly, inshallah. So it's a story. I'm saying this as an intellectual historian. It's a historical fact, but it's also a story. You understand when I explain it. So it's called, what I, I call it, the story of the first Dabi. So you would all know that anybody who met Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a state of iman, they are known as Sahaba. And the next generation are called Tabin. Tabin are those believers who never met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they had a chance to meet Sahaba. So historically, factually, there must have been somebody who is the very first Tabi. 
So I'm going to now tell you a story that will make you understand that historical reality. So I want you to imagine that somebody, let's just take it, let's just say that it's a man, could have been a woman, could have been a couple traveling together. Uh, why don't I do that? Let's say there's a man or woman who traveled together to Medina Manawara. And why? Because they had heard about Islam or they had met somebody who had accepted Islam and they made the decision, okay, we want to go accept Islam and we're going to go to Medina Manora. And this was happening on a daily basis. People were traveling and arriving in Medina Manora to meet Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to accept Iman. Now this couple, they arrive and they arrive and they see everybody's crying. And everybody's crying and everybody's bawling and they have in their life never ever seen such a scene of sadness and sorrow in their whole life. They try to go to people, they try to ask them, they're strangers, they're travelers, nobody recognizes them, maybe people don't pay attention. Finally, they grab because they came with their own talab. Right? There's a story of Talab. They came with a passion. They came with a passion to absolutely change their life and make a dramatic revolutionary change and accept Deen of Islam. So they're not going to go back. So they go to a person and say, look, what's going on? We have come to meet. Where is, who knows what they would have said. Where is Muhammad ibn Allah? Where is Al-Mustafa Al-Mustaba? Where is Nabi? Nabiullah? Where is Rasulullah? Now when they go to a person and ask that, that person just starts crying even more. That person starts crying even more. They're shocked. They go to the next person. Finally, somebody would have been able to take themselves out of their grief. So I'm going to make a story. Imagine it's Abu Huraira. So they kept going. They go all the way to Masjid Nabwi. They enter Masjid Nabwi. They reach the Sahaba Sufa and Abu Huraira. And he finally answers and he says, Oh, you just missed him. Allahu Akbar. Yani Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just passed away. You just came too late. <laughs> so I guarantee you historically, somebody fits this category. There is somebody. I don't know who they are. Allah Ta'ala knows who they are. This is the story of the first Tabi. Now what does Talab mean? Talab means nothing can deter you. This is the greatest lost opportunity, right? There can be no greater opportunity lost, I think, in the history of humanity or feeling of lost opportunity than that person who was told at that moment, you just missed Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We just got the news from Ummu Mu'mineen Sayyidah Aisha radiyatana anha from her hujra, from her dwelling, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away in her lap. Allahu Akbar. Hmm? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this man, this woman, this couple, this Tabi, they don't turn back. <laughs> so they're going, they ask Abu Huraira, okay, we missed him. Did you spend time with him? And then probably Abu Huraira, he starts crying again. <laughs> now he starts crying. <laughs> and then he probably rescues himself and says, recovers and says, yes, I spent time with him. Oh, did I spend time with him? Hmm? I spent the very best moments of my life with him. Hmm? So now what's the Tabi going to do? They're going to grab his hand and going to say, okay, we missed him. We're not going to miss you. That's how Tabi came into existence. They clung to the Sahaba Kiram radiallahu ta'ala anumajmain with such a talab, with such a passionate desire to learn Learn not just texts and words of hadith, but to learn that lived life. Abu Hurair didn't just take out his notebook and give it to them and say, okay, you can go, here's the hadith collection, here's the Quran. No. So what, what would they have said? They would say, look, we, well, they would grab him and say, that well then, we just missed him, we're not going to miss you. So every single thing you got from him, we want to take from you. That's called Tabi. That's called Talab. Udkhulu fissil mikafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran, I enter the deen of Islam entirely, completely. In other words, Talab means I want it all. That's Talab. I want it all. That Tabi sat down and grabbed Sayyidina Abu Huraira and said, I want it all. All of what you got. From Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa All that I missed. I want it all. And I want it all from you. Allahu Akbar. I'm then saying Abu Rara brother. He would say okay look. I spent years. In this case 2-3 years. In other case of Sahaba. 10-20 years. So you want to get all of what I got. From him. 
you're going to, to spend a whole lot of time with me. Hmm? So in this month, although our state will make this dua I'm about to say to you appear ludicrous, but you have to express your talab. Sometimes what happens in dua is you have a feeling in your heart and you're expressing that with your tongue. But sometimes in dua, for people like me and you often, what we have to do is we have to say the words in order to feel the feelings. So make a dua that's radical. Even though maybe right now the state of our heart doesn't have that radical desire. But if we keep making that dua, inshallah, Allah subhanahu And make also this dua itself, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the words on my tongue the true condition of my heart. So in other words, dua of talab in this in this in this last 10 15 days ya allah i want to understand every single verse and word of quran al-kareem ya allah i want to practice every single word and verse of quran al-kareem ya rabbi kareem i want to feel in my heart the feeling every feeling of every letter of every word of every verse of Quran al-Kareem. Ya Allah, I want to learn every single hadith and sunnah of Nabi al-Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I want to transform my life and live every second of my life according to every one of those verses of Quran and every one of those hadith. This is called talab. I want it all. Hmm? I want it all. Ya Allah Sponsor, I want to know you in every way that you may be known. I want to love you in every way that you may be loved. I want to fear you in every way that you may be feared. I want to make my toba to you in every way that toba can be made. I want to get every type of hidayah from you. I want to myself become from the Salihin in every sense that may be. Outer sense, inner sense, personal sense, family sense, public sense. These are the du'as to make. This is the talab to have. I want it all. And this is not the talab to have for dunya. When it comes to dunya, you want less. You were not sent in this world to become the vice chancellor or president of a university. You were not sent to this world to become the dean of the medical college. You can, yes, become a doctor. You can become a well-respected doctor. You can become a well-published doctor. You can, inshallah, become a highly rated and reviewed doctor. But there's a limit. <laughs> Because otherwise, if you go, sometimes I used to explain it like this, that if you go for the extras of the dunya, you will lose the extras of deen. Guaranteed. You can't have both. You can have deen and dunya. You can't have all the extras of the dunya and all the extras of deen. I've never seen anybody. Nor do I know of anyone. Have, and I have never read about or studied any, about anyone in history who had both. So what do you want? Hmm? And it's ingrained in us because, it, you know, the, the education system is pushing us in, in a large part, rightly so, but in a small part, dangerously so, is pushing us towards attainment and achievement and accomplishment. But now we have to curtail that this is called zod in deen, to have some, some sense in some way, some extent in which you utterly renounce the world. You scoff at the world. Kul mata'u dunya kalil, that this whole world is but a trifle. And this is one of the major lessons in Ramadan. Because we didn't even eat, we didn't even drink our basic core fundamental material needs. We scoffed at them. We renounced them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we can renounce the needs, not the extras of dunya, the absolute needs of dunya, that's why we should feel the pain and, and, and the pain of the famine and the starvation, the war crime being afflicted, right? Some of us... Um, I don't know how many of you feel hungry right now, but you know those of us who are in America, right? If if we've been fasting for whatever it is, 12, 13, 14 hours, it's nothing, nothing, not even a drop, not even a micro atom of the hunger that our ummah is facing in Gaza. But we were able to scorn that material need. Leave that, not scorn, but we were able to renounce that material need for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so make dua to Allah Ya Rabbi Kareem. In the same way you enabled me to go without the necessities of this world for your sake and for your pleasure in order to get closer to you, Ya Allah, enable me to go without the luxuries of this world. Because I'm chasing those luxuries. I'm chasing those extras. Hmm? So this is one thing we have to walk away. And I'm thinking about things that we should take away 
things that we need to leave Ramadan with is a sense of zod, the sense of ab- abstention to an extent from this world. So think about that story of that first tabi and try to ignite your thumb. And I'm just giving you examples. All of you should run with this on your own. You should make your own du'as from your own heart, in your own words, based on your own feelings. I'm just giving you an example. You express your talab in your du'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way that you can. Alright, going back, that said that uh, these especially last 10 days and nights are indeed special days and nights of forgiveness and as all of you know and i don't need to repeat uh, but i have you know many talks on this on the youtube channel standard ramadan talks talking about the last 10 days seeking layl together in the last odd nights if somebody is not very familiar with that listen to one of those talks but i would just say now that know that these five odd nights, 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th, all the way from Maghrib to Fajr, these are five incredible time spaces, right? Remember the first talk I told you about time and space, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of Ramadan, imagine as if you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you inside the Kaaba. Now I, I want you to just infinitize that. These time spaces from Maghrib to Fajr on these five odd nights are the most sacred time, the most blessed time you're going to have. So try to the extent that your schedule allows, push it a bit, max it a bit, right? Try to do as much ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't just go through the checklist and rote list of ibadah. Do some formal ibadah to, first of all, register that formal ibadah on that night so that you want to do a little bit of everything on that night. Pray some nafal salah, recite some Qur'an al-Kareem, say some zikr of la ilaha illallah, say some zikr of tasbih, say some zikr of hamd, say some zikr of takbir, say some zikr of la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, make zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name, call upon him using his infinitely beautiful names, make the sunnah du'as, make the du'as from the Qur'an, recite salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all the things, anything and everything that you've ever heard, try to do a little bit of it on each of those nights, right? And then just turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever your heart is inclined to on that night. Maybe you just feel like reciting three juz. Maybe you feel like just standing in long salah. Maybe you want to pray salat al tasbih. Maybe you just want to recite a thousand, ten thousand salawat. Maybe you just want to recite a thousand, ten thousand la ilaha illallah. Maybe you just want to make dua in sajda in English while crying. Or do any combination of the above. Be natural. And, and just share with you personally. You know, I've been opening up a lot to you, just especially this, our, our Zoom audience. You know, it, it's something, you know, it's easy, I think, uh, to open yourself up to complete strangers to, to whom you are also a complete stranger. So what I would sometimes do on these nights is I would, you know, again, exactly what I said, I would try to do a little bit of everything, anything and everything I'd heard. I'm going back. I still do this, but I'm going back to even back when I was an undergrad at University of Chicago. This is when I first learned about these things. This is what the type of stuff I was trying to do as a student. And then what I would do is I would just, whatever my heart felt like doing, I would do it. And I would do it as long as my heart was in it. And as soon as I felt like I was getting weary or tired, I would switch. So let's say I would start reciting Quran and just keep reciting, keep reciting, keep reciting. Then if I felt myself getting tired, not physically tired, now they will ask for love, but you know what happens? Tired of reciting Quran, a stuck for love, but this is reality. Right? I would immediately switch. I would stand up, pray to Rakah Salah. I would make Dua Tal Spawn I would make a long Sajza. Then I would start reciting Salawat. I would just keep shifting, keep shifting. I'm talking about those times when, it, inshallah, I know some of you are busy, but if you get the chance to spend the whole night, right? The whole night, literally the whole night in Ibadah, this is what you do. You just keep going. And then, it, 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 Alhamdulillah, inshallah, it, it becomes like a how to say, you kind of get into the zone, right? And you just want to just do non stop. Right? How many of us have studied non-stop for four hours or done ABC non-stop or even drived, right? a long drive non-stop? Sometimes there's, you need to get yourself in the zone. If you can't do it all five nights, try at least one night. One night, taste the sweetness of non-stop 
relentless, sustained ibadah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not us, it's the power that Allah subhanahu wa put in these five nights. Things will happen in these five nights that you will, will not happen to you in other nights. It's not you, <laughs> it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refracting and reflecting. These are called as anwarat, as tajaliyat, as fuzat. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reflecting, reflecting His nur of His hidayah, the light of His guidance, His barakah, His own blessings, His mercy, His guidance on us on these nights. It is a tremendous opportunity. Okay, if any one of you is unfortunate enough to be working a night shift like around, then your tongue and your heart all the time in the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just be in a craze that I'm going to maximize how much zikr I can silently, secretly do in an inaudible whisper and how much I can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my heart. Okay, let me now tell you a couple of hadith I selected for you. They're slightly more rare hadith. So this is, but they're completely sahih, so don't worry. Their first one is from the Muslim of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Rumla Ta'ala, narrated by Sayyidina Abu Sayyid al Khudri that he said, Inna lillahi utaqa'a fi kulli yawmin wa laylatin. Yani, fi Ramadan. That for Indeed, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are people whom He frees from the fire of Jahannam, means there are people who are freed from such level of sin in every day and every night of the month of Ramadan. Second, لِكُلِّ abdim minhum, And not only are they freed, but for each and every worshipful servant and slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from them, دَعْوَةٌ mustajaba. There is one dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer. Every day and every night hmm, of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. So just make those du'as. You don't know which one it's going to be. Make just constantly making du'as day and night, day and night, day and night. Shukr. One big thing uh, to be grateful for is just the fast. So sometimes you just have to go into sajjah and just do shukr yourself for this. Ya Allah, you're so kind, you enable me to fast. You're so loving. You allowed me to fast today. You allowed me to do something that is fard. How many faraid did I leave the whole year? How many fajr did I miss the whole year? How many times was it fard for me to control my anger? I couldn't do it. How many times was it fard for me to be respectful of my parents? I couldn't do it. How many faraid did I leave year round? And you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of your mercy and grace, you gave me 100% faraid, 100 marks. 100% of the faraid of the fast of Ramadan. This itself you could just spend a long time in sajda doing shukr for this. And remember also, Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said hadith narrated by, Imam, uh, by Sayyidina Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the ustad, ustad of the tabin. Hmm? Another story. Khair, I will give you that story. Narrated by Imam Bukhari, Allah ta'ala, that if Anyone misses a fast in Ramadan without a legitimate reason, what we call other, right? Even if they were to fast for the entire rest of their life, they would not be able to make up for that one missed fast. So what does that mean now? This Earlier in the month, we would have read this hadith to make sure that we don't miss anything. But now do shukr yellow, what did you give me? You gave me tawfiq to fast one day of Ramadan. You gave me tawfiq, means you, you gifted me and graced me with the ability to do this act that is so immense that had I missed it and then tried to fast every day of my whole life, it wouldn't have been able to make up for this day. And you gave it to me for free. Look at me, I'm not a person who gets 100% further than anything else. I don't have any hundreds in my book of deeds. And Ya Allah, you enable me, so especially when we get into the last 10 days and 27th, and especially on the 29th, right? When you reach the 29th, uh, you know, complete the 29th fast, or that would be eat, so let's say the 29th night, right? The night, yes, the night of the 29th, this is a special. I'm just sharing with you things that I do, but you can come up with your own things, right? The point is that you need to connect your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right. Another thing, shukr, that Ya Allah, Ramadan is my last bastion. I look back on my last 12 months and I see that there's only one thing, one safety net that you catch me in every year 
huge sugar to respond yalla again you caught me yalla again the whole year i was lack nakadizical and yalla again you caught me and yalla you've been doing this for me you've been doing it for 5 years 10 years my case 30 years yalla just to sugar so much sugar to allah subhanahu taala why la in shagartu ma zidannakum allah subhanahu taala said in quran if you grateful to me he will increase you and we need it and make this dua yalla subhanahu taala the same way you caught me this year in ramadan yalla i'm going to need that for the rest of my life Ya Allah, make dua. Ya Allah, please decree for me now at this very moment that every Ramadan for the rest of my life I will be able to fast all the first fast in Ramadan. Decree for me, Ya Allah. Like let's say you're up in one of those nights. Ya Allah, in every Ramadan, Ya Allah, you will let me give rise and give life to these odd nights. Ya Allah, if you're enabling me to find the ultimate qadr on this night, that every year, Ya Allah, for the rest of my life, you all will give me the ultimate qadr. So, you, shukr, you're looking at the moment, you're looking at the past, you're also using that shukr. to ask Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the mazid to give you more to continue that and increase that upon you in the future so a lot of shukr a lot and this is a, one example i give you you can make the same shukr for salah make the same shukr for dua make the same shukr if you heard recitation of quran tarawih make the same shukr if you recited quran all the things that we didn't do year round right and again keep interspersing that i will keep keep I, you know because it, it's getting long now but keep interspersing that with the dua for the people of Gaza keep making interspersing that making tawbah on behalf of the whole ummah keep interspersing that by making dua that ya allah please raise amongst this ummah that strength again that can counter evil that wisdom again that can counter evil that might and power again that can defend itself against evil another thing again i would just touch on this very briefly is itikaf and i would just say this that again it's a i've covered this topic this topic extensively uh elsewhere but just know that this is something that sayna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam did every year and i'm looking literally at this uh you know wakana yattakifu kull aam that nabi akram sallallahu this is words in hadith of sahih bukhari that nabi akram sallallahu alayhi wa used to do this every year Now many of us may not be able to do it for all 10 days and 10 nights. So what a lot of people don't know is that you can do it as much as you can. Some people put a tag and label on this they call nafal itikaf. You can tag it like that if you want, but the point is the spirit that the spirit is to enter seclusion and retreat in the masjid. I'm going to come and explain this for the women in a moment. It's enter seclusion and retreat in the masjid. or if you're a woman that you designate some place and wherever you in your residence you just kind of designate it's up to you you're like the mutawalli of your own you know uh, mu'takaf place where you will do itikaf it could be your bedroom it can be a corner of your bedroom it could be a wing it can be two bed whatever right you designate a place and you and, and it'd be nice if you could set up a little bit right uh, right declutter a little bit you know maybe set it up with some you know okay and So for men in the masjid and for men and for women in that place in the residence and if you can't do it for all 10 days and nights do it as much as you can this should also be a craze literally as soon as you walk in you should be in the zone okay I walked home I'm going to let's say let's say you're on shift I'm going to sleep in that part of my residence I'm going to eat in that part of residence the same way and you can google this you'll find it is very easy to find and read the rules if it's itikaf if you're sitting in the full 10 days apply them on yourselves as much as you can to get that spirit and feeling of seclusion and retreat as much as you can right it might just be one hour a day it might literally be but it's a zone right and it's very important and when you're there you turn your screens off your phones off you become unreachable and this helps a lot it helps a lot to connect with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then if you have a day off or even a weekend off try the whole 24 hours or the whole 48 hours or the whole 72 hours and you can find inshallah some masjid that will let you just sit there uh you know for that time max you can exit to eat if you need to and for the women just go in the zone try as much as you can this is an incredible thing sometimes you know i imagine it this way the sayna rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what is it the asl about him is in nubuwa is dawa right is calling humanity to believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but there's something so special about these last 10 days and nights so this is about the days as well you can do it in the days and just about the nights something so special that 
even Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam temporarily suspended the work of at least going out in the people and doing da'wah. There were still some gatherings at Masjid Nabawi, but even from the hadith we realize that the majority of the time that the Prophet Wasallam spent in this time in Itikaf was in Ibadah. So it's an incredible type of Ibadah that takes place in these 10 days and 10 nights. All you have to do is just make this intention that you're doing this and you can if it helps you, you can say you're making niya of nafal itikaf and entering your designated space for a woman in a residence and for a man in the masjid. And yes, uh, for those women who have access to masajid or in you know, those masajid have women's areas, you could go uh, to that women's area in the masjid uh, as well. All right. Laylatul Qadr. So just seek it in all of those five odd nights. And just, you know, I've already explained this. I just wanted to do this dua. Uh, and then maybe I'll end on that. Uh, so, Ummu Mu'mineen Sayyida Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's interesting what she said. The first part of the hadith, uh, she asked that if I know which night is Laylatul Qadr, what should I say during it? So that itself is interesting that there is a sense that she thought she could know it. And some say, you know, I would just say that, you know, just try for all five. Some say there's a slightly greater chance for the 27th. Some like to say there's a moderately greater chance for the 27th. Uh, and some I, some even say that, you know, it's your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make, accept that du'a on any night at the level of Layl to Qadr because he is Allah kulli shay'in qadir, right? So remember that. Uh so here, the Prophet ﷺ responded and he told her this du'a, Kuli, that, O oh, Aisha, you should say. And mashallah, again, she was ustad of the tabin and she shared this stuff. She told people, so make a lot of du'a for all these sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala on your mind, that they truly gave it their all. They truly transmitted all of what they learned from Rasulullah ﷺ so that you and me, all of the ummah, could learn it and live it. Allahumma innaka afuun. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu afwa fa'fu anni. So this word af, right? Often in English you'll find it being translated as pardon, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's like more soft and tender and loving than uh, maghfira and rahma, which obviously are also very soft, tender, and loving. But it's a special, soft, tender type of intimate, almost type of forgiving, right? And so this is one of Allah Subhanahu Taala's names. Uh, so that's why you say Inna Kafuwan that Allah Taala, you indeed are the being who is the being of tender pardoning itself to Himbo Afwa, and in fact you love to intimately, tenderly, I almost want to say sweetly, kindly pardon Fa'fu Anni, and therefore pardon me. And it's just such a short sweet, succinct dua, and you can just, you could say this thousands of times, right? In these last 10 days and nights. This could be something, if you're on a round or if you're working, you could say in an inaudible whisper. So here, these were just a few things. There's so much, alhamdulillah, hidayah in our deen. Uh, but really, all what we, we just need a spark, right? And take this, and, you know, try to remember this. I don't know where you're all listening to it right now. But try to remember this, especially in those odd nights. Try to remember me and your du'a as well and my family. And I remember all of you and all of your families. And we should remember our real family, our spiritual family, our family that is our family because of our mutual connection. In La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And remember the ummah. And really, if nothing else, if you feel tired, say, so okay, look, if nothing else, I just make dua for the ummah. I might be too tired to stand in any more salah. I might be too tired to recite any more Quran. I'm thinking, if again, if you're trying to stay up on those nights, uh, but never, ya Allah, I, will, I can never let myself be too tired to make dua for this ummah because that is the sunnah of my Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa that he also used to tire himself in the night in his worship and making dua for his ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this Ramadan from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to get 
all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah and mercy in this month, all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hidayah and guidance in this month. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us from the salihin, muttaqeen, mu'mineen, wa akhirun da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbin alameen.